The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention have declared that prescription drug abuse is a nationwide epidemic. Opioids, long used in the treatment of chronic and intractable pain, are increasingly identified as culprits. How do we strike the right balance of enforcement against abuse and providing patients access to treatments that can mean the difference between living a normal life or living in misery? Joining us to share the perspective of both enforcement and quality of care are Virginia Herald, Executive Officer for the California Board of Pharmacy, and a family practice physician from Woodland, Dr. Carol Kimball, next on Studio Sacramento. At Five Star Bank, we create thoughtful solutions to help the capital region thrive, from economic development and education to public health and safety, issues that are vitally important to Sacramento's prosperity. We're proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. Jenny, we've all heard that there is a epidemic and a crisis with opioid addiction in this country. Describe the problem. Well, the problem is, is that there are a wide variety of painkillers. And since the early 1990s to mid 1990s, you've tre we've treated pain as the fifth vital sign, which means it, before that, it hadn't been really addressed as part of the treatment plan. And into that mix, we have a lot of very strong and effective painkillers, but they also come with some addictive qualities. So in this country right now, one of the problems is, is that um, pain relievers are responsible, along with other drugs such as heroin, but mixed together, we end up with 91 deaths a day from prescription drug. 91 prescription drug overdoses mixed with the heroin use, which is triggered when you can no longer get access to the prescription drugs. So the end result is we've got a horrible problem in California. It's not as severe as in some areas such as Appalachia and in Florida. They have had over the last probably 10 to 15 years really high prescription drug abuse problems. And when we first started, I've been with the board now for 27 years, which is a very long time. I've seen a lot of things come and go during that period. But one of the things that we've seen is an increasing growth in the level of prescription drug abuse and the resultant deaths from that. Okay, Dr. Kimball, explain to us as a clinician what from the professional, from the profession side of the equation is going on with regards to, to medication and people taking what's legitimate treatment and using it for unintended purposes? A lot of what happens is patients come in and they get asked about their pain every single visit and then they start having expectations that we can cure their pain and that there's that perfect pill that will cure all of their pain. And physicians usually pressed for time, oftentimes will prescribe narcotics for short-term um, uh, issues or um, for like a surgery. And so many, many patients have actually experienced what pain relief they get from narcotics or opiates. And so when they have pain, they expect to be treated with something that strong, which works for something short, but when you have a long time chronic pain, it's not the best choice, and it's certainly not the best choice to start with. So I want to take you both back a number of years on, on this subject. In the early 90s, the discussion in the media uh, among policymakers and regulators like yourself was we have ratcheted down and made so punitive the system to access these medications that we have patients who are suffering and that we need to put in place guidelines where we open access up to these medications. And we, as you said, Jenny, you know, pain is the fifth vital sign. Or you go into your physician's office and you have the scale from the happy face to the crying face up on the wall. Is, 
is the current focus on this issue sort of the fad of the moment or are we really facing a crisis right now? Well, let me just say that about four years ago, you ended up with four federal agencies, none of which usually works together particularly well, all agree that we had an epidemic. And you're seeing them work together to kind of address it. What four agencies? That was the Drug Enforcement Administration, the Food and Drug Administration, the Centers for Disease Control, and the Office of Drug Policy, which is part of the White House, the President's um, arm. And the end result was a concerted effort to start addressing some of this because there was increasing numbers of patients becoming addicted and dying from them, including our kids. In San Diego, for example, we had the Drug Enforcement Administration establishing parent support groups for parents who had kids that, become, that had become addicted to painkillers. And that's not a role they normally would play. Dr. Kimball, explain to us how someone becomes addicted on these medications. What, what, what's the process that people go through? So, first of all, they have to have access to the medication. So, that's part of the reason. We were told in the 90s that people th who have real pain don't get addicted. But it turns out that's not really true. And we kind of knew that people with real pain would become habituated to it. In other words, if they stopped taking it suddenly, they'd have symptoms such as diarrhea or, or and, and anxiety when they stopped the medication. So we knew that would happen, but we assumed that they wouldn't become psychologically dependent upon it, um, which is part of the addiction process. So really, you become addicted by taking it and taking it again and more and on a regular basis and probably also trying to drive your pain down to zero. Okay, so what I'm trying to understand is the distinction between the, the old, no there was a notion at a time that anyone that was addicted to yeah. any form of medication, this was a societal bad and needed to be prosecuted. But I can remember arguments where someone would say, well, if you have a terminally ill patient or a patient with a cancer diagnosis who is bedridden or in hospice, and you are giving them these types of narcotics in order to stabilize them and make them comfortable, yeah. what you really have to separate is the addiction from the antisocial behavior and that there are cases where that's appropriate. And I'm just for, for purposes of, of, of setting the conversation, I want to make sure that, that we've got it right on understanding that not everyone is treated the same way. You mean uh, chronic between, pain be, between, and, and uh, Between the life. terminally ill right. or end of life and people suffering from chronic pain. I don't, I mean, I, when I talk to my physicians, Nobody has any qualms whatsoever on giving somebody who's dying comfort measures. And even to the point that they get a little over sedated if, if that is their choice, not to kill anybody, but to really keep people comfortable. Where the epidemic happened was really when you should be treating chronic low back pain or chronic shoulder pain or other chronic kinds of pains that weren't caused by a terminal illness. You should be treating those people with the pain medications, um, that they weren't going to get addicted because they had real pain. And I think that's where things started to turn because then it became much, much more common. I had knee surgery. I took two Vicodin. The prescription was 40. What's going to happen to the other 38 pills? And it's, it's, that's, that was sort of the universal kind of, you give them 40, because there are certain people who will go through all 40 and need another 40, but most people don't. And so now you have all of these people that for any interaction with the pain, with the medical, a medical provider, have a bottle three quarters full of the narcotic because they don't tend to use it. But maybe somebody else in their family will or maybe the, somebody else will take it and sell it on the street. And is that where the Board of Pharmacy is focused? Well, that's part. I mean, it, as, as 
Carol. Dr. Carol, thank you. I was <laughs> wondering how far to go there. Um, as Carol just said, part, part of our concern is there are two levels, and you gave a perfect example where you get 40 pills where perhaps you only needed two. And you go to a dentist and you get additional pills there, and then you fell and skinned your knee and you maybe get something else. And so you end up with this whole array of drugs that are sitting there, and you take one of those instead of maybe taking an ibuprofen or an aspirin, which would be more appropriate and maybe even more effective in dealing with the pain. And pretty after a while, you just get so habituated to having this arsenal of relatively heavy-duty painkillers available that you do become habituated to them. And for us, we require our pharmacists to provide a double check on a physician's prescribing. So the reason that they go, the reason that a pharmacist goes to school for six to eight years, typically post high school, is so that they can really get in and become the drug therapy experts. So just because a physician has written a prescription, we expect the pharmacist to take a look and is it the right therapy for the patient? Is the patient w it known what is known as opiate naive and isn't familiar with this particular opiate drug? Opiate naive. naive. Can you tell us what does that it mean? It means that you're not used to taking a particular narcotic drug, is probably as good a way as any to say that, and that should you be started on a high dose instead of a low dose, there's a potential that you could become overdosed and frankly die. What do you want the families and the public who are uh, out just living their lives right now in California to know about this issue that they're probably not paying attention to right now? They need to know that these drugs are very serious medicines that just because they take away your pain and they may be prescribed in high quantities, it doesn't mean that they're safe to take. And because of their addicti addictive nature, it's probably better that you don't keep them around, or if you're going to keep them around, you keep them under lock and key, or you keep them in a spot where you can monitor their use. Um, our children, for example, are using these drugs for party purposes, and they become addicted, and that is the frightening part. You have these, and often they're, some of the brightest children get involved in these drugs and they end up overdosing and dying. And that is a loss. And so what we want people to do is to work with their physicians, to work with their pharmacists, and to periodically clean out those medicine cabinets of outdated drugs. That if you've got some leftover pain pills from that knee surgery that you had two years ago and you still have them, Maybe you shouldn't give them to your kid when he just had a football injury. If, if we end up with the 40 pills uh, that Carol just brought up, what can we do with them? There are various ways you can dispose of them. Far, we're in the process now of finalizing regulations to allow pharmacies to set up what we call drug take-back programs that will allow them to dispose of them in a very specific manner. And because these drugs are so valuable, some of these pills are 30 or $40 a piece on the street there's a big incentive. Those drugs are worth a lot more on the street, frankly, than they are in the pharmacy. And so we want them to be appropriately disposed of. So there is mailbox-like devices being installed in some pharmacies where patients will be able to go in and dispose of their drugs. Um, just basically don't ask, don't tell, just dispose of them. Um, so that's one thing we want patients and their families to do, is to get rid of the unwanted pharmaceuticals. That 50% of people that ultimately end up with a prescription drug abuse problem, get them for free from a family member. Here, really? take this. Take this, this will make you feel better. And we've got another 22% of the, of the people that end up with problems down the road end up actually having them prescribed by a single doctor. So it doesn't fit the traditional pattern of going to six different physicians. It's under the care of one physician you end up with some of these medications that ultimately end up causing an addiction problem down the road, either for you or someone else. Are these medications the only line of defense for people that have chronic pain? No. And, and, and so when people come in with chronic pain, you, you try to evaluate what the pain's from. If it's actually caused by nerve pain, then we want to use things that affect the nerves themselves directly. So there are some old antidepressants that work for that, and there's things like gabapentin um, that can be quite useful for that. But for musculoskeletal, um, really anti-inflammatories work really well. 
um, and like ibuprofen, like ibuprofen, Aleve, even Tylenol works very well. They have their pros and cons, and so you don't want to take too much. Um, I can I can tell you stories of people who've taken too much Advil and Aleve. Um, what one of the things that I think happens is that people expect to be able to take a pill, the little magic pill that will make all of their pain go away. So when you take too much Aleve every single day, in two or three months, you could really damage your kidneys and your livers. Um, you could also cause an ulcer. When you take too much of an opioid, then you can stop breathing today. And stopping breathing is really how most people die, is that they stop breathing. Because all of these opiates depress respirations. So you don't even realize that you're not breathing. What, what causes the escalation? You know, the, the person who takes one opioid and then they're taking four and then they're taking more and more and more. What, what happens physiologically that, that causes that? So the opioid receptors, and I'm going to guess you're a pharmacist, so you probably know this at least Actually, as well. I'm not a pharmacist. Really? Okay. I'm just posing as one at okay. the moment. But anyhow, so she there's regulates them. <laughs> yeah, I do regulate them. There are several different opioid receptors. And so the, the narcotics um, cover up or uh, block those receptors. And eventually, all of those get covered. But uh, if a new stimulus comes in, those, those, those receptors are already working and so you want to take more to try to see if any of the other receptors are covered. Can you blow out your receptors? You know, we think that you can. There, back in the 90s we thought, no, there's no way that you would do that. There's nobody to have become addicted. But as more and more people are using higher and higher doses, then yes, it appears that when you're over 100 to 120 morphine equivalents every day of what you're taking, you can become hypersensitive to medication. And then the medicine's not going to help you at all. And yet you still crave it because when the doses come off, you start withdrawing. So one, one question, the reason I'm asking you the question is because so when a person becomes an addict and they're not getting relief from the old dose and then they've got to take higher doses, Correct. and at a certain point they just plateau and it's not working anymore, even if they went cold turkey, do their receptors over time go back to normal so that that way th they actually can receive relief again? We think so. Um, but it, so it, we think it, that yes, you would become able to take an opiate again, but it's probably not reset to what it would have been like if you were opiate naive. S these drugs have been around for a very, very long time. Some of them, some of them are relatively new. Really? They've got some very potent drugs that have been developed in the last few years to target specific kinds of pain. And, uh, and the advertising campaigns for them are also relatively um, effective in convincing people that this may be something I want to try. I, okay, that's new news because I was under the impression that some of these are very old and, and I was going to ask the question, where is it, because pain is such an issue for so many people, the expectation would be that uh, there would be a lot of product development to try and create safer remedies for people that, that are facing pain. The I see where you're going. There actually are de abuse deterrent formulations of some of the most popular drugs in terms of diversion or self-use for non-legitimate medical purposes. Now there's a string of words. <laughs> um, but, but the real concern even with those drugs, those are the drugs that where you put that abuse deterrent in to stop the abuse so that patients won't will take them as prescribed, won't take them for abuse, and yet sometimes they still find ways around them. But not all drugs do that. Not all drugs have those kinds of formulations. And one of the most popular drugs on the market right now for abuse is, has been formulated in higher strengths with a, an abuse deterrent form. But the lower strength drug can still be crushed and snorted. Which drug, a drug is this? Well, she doesn't like to give information so that people go ask their doctors for it. Uh, I, un I understand. <laughs> Oxycodone is what uh, okay, I'm talking so, about specifically. So how is it, if we're with our family members or our friends, mm -hmm. what are the signs of opioid addiction? Because 
sometimes uh, uh, I would assume that you don't necessarily, if you're opioid naive, you may not be able to notice the signs in someone else. Well, let me just suggest that as the parent in this kind of situation, you need to go online and do some research because you may not be adept at looking at what would be classic signs for addiction appearing in your children, which is really, I think, what we're looking at. But your spouse could be involved. You could have a, a parent that you're taking care of that could also be addicted. So there's a lot of different permutations. But there's some wonderful information out there that is available through our website and through websites of the CDC. And Want to give your other, website? www.pharmacy.ca.gov. Okay. Thank you very much for the plug. I feel like now I'm promoting my own product. Um, but you need to become aware. You need to become positioned so that you can address issues where your child, going through the teenage years, is already extraordinarily difficult for, those, for the kids. And you may not be able to differentiate whether or not there's some problem going on or it's actually an addiction issue, either manifesting itself or actually in full-blown mode, and you need some help to do that. And generally, the kids won't tell you. But one of the things we do see is that you start in the home taking the drugs that are available to you or with your friends taking the drugs that are available to them. And then when you go through those and you can no longer have access to them, then you start turning to things like heroin and cheap drugs because heroin is very cheap compared to the price of a single oxycodone pill that may be $30, $40, $50. Heroin, you can get a dose for $10 or less. Wow. And, and so you're looking at situations where the cost of the prescription drug, which is viewed as safer, which perhaps is not true either, forces you to the lower cost drug and all the accoutrements that go with that. Doctor. Help us understand, for those of us who face chronic pain or we have a loved one that we're advocating for, give us some advice on how to interact with healthcare professionals like yourself in, in one, having reasonable expectations on getting treatment for, for pain, mm -hmm. and secondly, how, where's the, if you can give us any advice on a line as to how to responsibly ask when we're not getting the relief that we, we think that we should expect? So the first thing is make sure you're clear on what you're asking for first. So are you going in just for pain relief or is your pain actually preventing you from living a normal life? Almost everybody has some form of pain. Maybe it comes, maybe it goes, but maybe it doesn't interact with your day. So I have low back pain, like most Americans, um, and I can do some stretching in the morning and I get out and I'm fine. There are many people who will go to the doctor's office and expect a, a Norco or hydrocodone so they can get out of bed instead of doing stretching. So you want to go to the doctor, you want to be clear on what your symptoms are, what it's preventing you from doing, and then asking all the other things besides a magic pill to make it better. So it, is there physical therapy? Should you be seen by a specialist who will do a, a more thorough exam or, or at least a more focused exam to really say this is where your pain is originating, this is what's causing your pain? And then what are the other options? So should you be taking Advil? What's a safe amount of Advil? Should you be on a prescription strength ibuprofen? Um, what kind of monitoring should be done to make sure that you're safe? Um, and then just sort of going back and saying, okay, we did this and this was my, my treatment goal was to be able to get out of bed and go for a run. Or my treatment goal was to get out of bed and be able to make myself breakfast. You know, were you able to make that goal? And then, if you weren't, what are other options? Not always going to a narcotic. Um, we try to make it so a narcotic would, for chronic pain is your choices go to the emergency room because you're just not able to do it or to take this medicine. Um, I do have people, I have a lot of people on chronic narcotics. Um, we monitor what are they able to do. Are they keeping a job? Um, I had one person who couldn't take the narcotics and drive, so she couldn't keep a job. And then we have to really look, is that really the right medicine for you? 
if, if you have to lose your job for this. And we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you both. And that's our show. Thanks to our guests and thanks to you for tuning into Studio Sacramento. I'm Scott Syfax. See you next time right here on KVIE. At Five Star Bank, we create thoughtful solutions to help the capital region thrive, from economic development and education to public health and safety, issues that are vitally important to Sacramento's prosperity. We're proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. All episodes of Studio Sacramento, along with other KVIE programs, are available to watch online at kvie.org video.